Okay, good morning, everybody. My name is not Raul Karstocha, and to some people's disappointment, um, it's not Raul who's chairing the first panel today, but myself, Alexander Korb. I'm Associate Professor in Modern European History at the University of Leicester with the Stanley Burton Center of Holocaust and Genocide Study. And I just swapped panel with Raoul, so Raoul will um, chair this afternoon's panel, and I myself will also be presenting in the panel tomorrow. Uh, this morning's panel is entitled Eth Ethnic Struggles, Questioning the State Monopoly of Violence. And we have three outstanding speakers joining us from Warsaw, Vilnius, and New York City. It's Zachary Mazur from the College of Europe, Nathalie in Warsaw, but based in New York, Jagoda Wierczewska from the University of Warsaw, and Thomas Balkelis from the Lithuanian Institute of History in Vilnius. I will introduce the uh, speakers in order of speaking. Uh, of course, it's the privilege of the morning panel that we are all fresh and energized and still um, keen to find out new things about um, Central Eastern Europe in this particular panel. Um, some are more and some are less uh, fresh and energized. And um, in New York City, of course, it's 4 a.m. in the morning. So um, kudos and our admiration go out to Zachary, who set his alarm clock at 3.15 in order to be able to partake in this panel. Thank you very much. Um, Zachary. His talk is entitled Sovereignty and Legitimate Violence, Microstates in East Central Europe, 1918 till 1921. Zachary is a research fellow, um, as I said, at the College of Europe, Napoline, and he is a visiting scholar at the Polish Academy of Sciences at the Historical Institute at Warsaw. He has completed his PhD at Yale in 2018 under Tim Snyder. And in his current book project, Zachary explores the connection between sovereignty claims and the growth of state power in interwar Poland. Um, Zachary, the floor is yours. You have 25 minutes for your presentation. And I will uh, send gentle reminders in the chat room should any of you guys go or start to go over time. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Can everyone hear me? Just double checking. All right, good. Um, so good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. Yes, I am in New York, but normally I'm in Warsaw. It just happened to be that I was uh, here now. But anyway, um, so let's, let's dive in. Um, so you heard the title already, um, and I want to Kind of bring us to the end of World War One, and we obviously go from a world of empires to a world of, of nation states. And in the the narratives that we that we see, we um, we used to see kind of a, a magical appearance of nation states after World War One. And the newer scholarship that we see coming out now, or that has been coming out for the past few years, um, has highlighted the chaos uh, of of empires disappearing of occupying armies disappearing and uh, and paramilitaries kind of filling in the gap, um, filling in that lack of, of sovereignty with, with violence. Um, and certainly there was chaos and, and violence, but there is another set of processes going on. And, uh, and putting a magnifying glass to, to this chaos reveals that in some cases, the, the imperial or occupation power was actually replaced by some local authority. So that's what I want to talk about today. Um, and as you can see from the title, I have this strange term microstates. I sometimes called them mini states or something like that. Um, it could be quasi states or, or de facto states, uh, though these terms are, are generally reserved for polities that do not get recognition. Um, but some of the microstates that I'm going to talk about today actually did get international recognition and were treated seriously in some ways. So. Uh, I don't think that de facto states, for example, works uh, works as a term. Um, yeah, but I, I just kept on coming across 
in my research on East Central Europe right after World War One, I kept on coming across these brief mentions of short-lived fleeting little states. And, and I've always been fascinated with ephemeral polities um, because I think that when we examine them closely, we, we start to understand the core of what makes a state a state. What are they composed of? What are the key elements? Um, and what are those, those key pieces that we all recognize as being part of, of a state and statehood? And some of these material traces like stamps, currency, stationary, these tokens of statehood, um, they become all that remains of the towns and counties that briefly became countries when the empires fell apart. But those little bits of paper, paper represent uh, a fleeting sovereignty that for a moment in some corner of the region, uh, people respected the authority not of an emperor, but of a local council elected by, by the people. Um, one of the most fascinating examples is the, the town of Schwenten. So I'm going to pull up my presentation now, uh, try not to abuse this. All right. Um, this little village of about 800 people in the, the Posen province was mostly German speaking, and many people feel, feared ab absorption into the Polish ruled polity that was growing from the East um, and the, the prospect of revolution spreading in post-war Germany. So events brewing on either side of Schwenten highlighted the dangers surrounding them. Uh, to the east, the Greater Poland Uprising showed that the Poles could wrest power away from Germany. To the west, the November Revolution was underway with various workers and soldiers' councils cropping up all over the country. And so the local Lutheran pastor uh, declared independence with himself as, as head of state. Um, they managed to put together a full administration, police, and a small military force. Uh, it was kind of a, a interesting series of events that led to this. When in December 1918, um, the pastor who I mentioned, Emil Hegemann, uh, he, he set off to Glogau, which is now Guogu, uh, to enlist the help from the German garrison there and, and informed um, and the, the commanding officers there actually told him that uh, he wouldn't get any help because the soldiers' councils were, were now in charge and they could not offer Schwenten uh, protection from Polish militaries. Um, and while in Glogo, Hegemann was shocked to hear someone lecture on the principle of self-determination of nations, uh, but citing Lenin and not Wilson. Uh, the speaker also clearly justified what the Poles were doing in Poznań and other formerly German cities. And having seen the fall of his own countrymen and the encroaching Poles, um, who were already taken over nearby uh, Volstein or Volstein, um, in January 1919, Hegemann declared the village independent and neutral under the name Freistadt uh, Schwenten, as we see. Um, elections were held shortly thereafter, um, and, and they set up an army with about 100 men. Um, and in rather quick succession, in 1919, um, Schwenten actually gained recognition from uh, Warsaw, then from Germany, then finally the Allied Commission in Paris. Um, in August 1919, Polish groups uh, consolidated their powers in the pro uh, Prussian provinces to the east. And, uh, and finally, the local parliament in Schwenten declared their, uh, their intent to join Germany, which was, um, which was accepted. And, uh, and that became the border between, between Germany and Poland for the rest of uh, the period. And this act itself uh, clearly indicates the power and sovereignty that the short-lived Republic had. They were able to legally join their territory to the German state uh, of, their own, of their own will. And here is, uh, yeah, this is a shot from Google Maps of where the, the village is, just to give you a better sense of its location between Poznan and Berlin. Uh, have those other cities. Okay, so I'm gonna turn this off and go back to me for a moment. Um, so the existence of these micro states means the existence of some micro sovereignty, some level of authority and power over the territory of its people. Um, sovereignty of course is never 
infinite in time or space. On the contrary, sovereignty is often fleeting and always limited territorially. Therefore, it should be self-evident that the sovereignty of microstates can theoretically be as legitimate for its time and space uh, as any other sovereignty claims. And oftentimes when we read about this immediate post-war period, uh, it is about uh, how all authority and sovereignty disappears from the map of East Central Europe. But perhaps we should be thinking about some kind of sovereignty dispersed or, or maybe sovereignty emanating uh, only from the local people as opposed to from a central government. Um, sovereignty, instead of disappearing when empires fall, can just be dispersed into smaller and smaller units. And the material remains of empires, of course, lived on for many years after the empires disappeared. Local administrators used the same laws, the same forms, the same filing systems. Uh, the teachers were the same, public works remained the same. But the ultimate authority on which these things rested shifted away from a central capital into the local context. Okay, now that I've said the word sovereignty a hundred times, uh, I should probably pause to define what I mean. Um, in this context, there are two towering definitions of sovereignty or explanations of sovereignty rather that we tend to see in the literature over and over. For example, in Leonard Smith's recent work, Sovereignty at the Peace, Paris Peace Conference, he references two familiar maxims. Weber's famously claimed uh, the legitimate use of force within a defined territory as the definition of sovereign power. And Carl Schmitt's summary that sovereign is he who decides the exception. These two definitions are certainly helpful for understanding the concept of sovereignty and they highlight the primacy of violence and force, especially in this chaotic post-war period, these definitions seem to fit quite well. And in fact, these German scholars came up with these definitions at precisely this time in history. So it's no surprise. Um, but there are some questions that remain. Weber's oft repeated definition uses the word legitimate, but we do not learn what that means exactly. In essence, it could be anything. In this post-war context, one paramilitary group shows up one day requisitioning grain, um, and that is legitimate. And then the next day, uh, another group does the same, and that too can be legitimate um, according to this definition. Um, so it seems arbitrary in the Weberian sense, uh, legitimacy does. And it becomes impossible to, to sort out which acts of, of violence or force are legitimate or illegitimate. Um, using the air quotes here. Uh, the first question that arises then is, could microstates engage in legitimate violence? If microstates can be said to have actual sovereignty, then can these microstates deploy legitimate force? What's the difference between a mini state claiming sovereignty over a territory and the military occupation that they replaced? And perhaps it's simply a question of, of perception. Are these mini entities really states that can garner respect and the appearance of legality? Uh, were they seen as legitimate in any way by the populations they ruled over? And how can we even begin to think about legitimacy and therefore sovereignty if force and exceptionalism are the rule? So it seems that another important political theorist could be brought in to, uh, to fill in the blank. Um, and I think that is uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. With Rousseau, we get sovereignty and legitimacy together. Both are derived from the political community itself. Uh, when people come together to form a single unit to decide their own futures. In uh, Rousseau's social contract, uh, he wrote about a transition from absolute monarchy to a healthy republic, where all people would contribute their voice to the decision-making process and express their collective will, or at least the will of the majority. Um, and this, of course, was supposed to lead to political choices that would be in the, the interest of the people and not against their interests. In other words, self-determination, something familiar of the post-World War I period. Uh, and this idea was obviously power, powerfully spreading around Europe at the end of the war. So there's a clear affinity between the period when Rousseau uh, is thinking in the 18th century and the post-World War I period. And we get a, a much wider dispersion of self-determination in this period than Rousseau possibly could have imagined. Um, so direct democracy 
seems to be the first stage of this transition from empires to, to nation states. It's a great irony of history that Rousseau's ideas were applied to the national scale when he had in mind that a small republic like Geneva would be the model for legitimating government through the will of the people. Um, within a larger geographic area, it would be quite difficult to ensure that individuals could have their voices heard. But on the local level, after World War I, this is exactly what happened. As in the case of Fenton that I just mentioned, the town voted and acted in concert as a voluntary independent polity outside of Germany and Poland. The various Rusin republics are another perfect example of this, where villagers gathered to vote on their future and they delegated their power to local elites and priests and administrators. I'm gonna go back to the maps. Uh, so in the Subcarpathian region, the Hutzels decided to forego the other available choices and declare independence. A group of demobilized soldiers from the area uh, attacked Hungarian gendarmes stationed in Rakhiv or Rajo, uh, as it was called then, um, in January 1919. And with their new stockpile of weapons, they declared a republic, the Hutzel Republic. They had a 42-member council and four-man executive government. Uh, the new state fielded an army of around a thousand men, and the soldiers were quickly, quickly called to arms against the encroachments of Romanian troops. For the next few months in 1919, the Hutsul state ruled over a territory with 20,000 inhabitants. Uh, there is little indication that this new form of government dramatically affected the lives of its citizens, but it continued to be a thorn in the side of its larger neighbors. So in that sense, the sovereignty declared was enough of a threat to emerging successor states that they needed to deal with it directly. The Preshov Ruthenian Council decided the fate of all uh, Subcarpathian Ruthenian, Ruthenians who joined Czechoslovakia in April 1919. Prior to the Treaty of Trianon, however, democratic Hungarian troops attempted to hold on to the territory of the former kingdom. As a result, they came into direct conflict with the Hutzel army and ended its brief rule in June 1919. The area then came into the Czechoslovak state as of September 1919. On the other side of the Capriathan Mountains, another Ruthenian group, uh, the Lemkos, or uh, Wemkos, however you want to pronounce it, um, presented two different visions for the future. Lemkos to the south of, of Krakow and uh, Nova Sanj formed a relatively durable microstate called the Lemko Rusin People's Republic. Uh, this is the current location of the Hutzel Republic, sorry. So here's the Lemko People's Republic. We see it south of Krakow. Um, quite, a, quite a big one, actually. Um, so the Lemko Rusin People's Republic. At the end of November, local people started gathering at mass meetings to discuss their future. And were inspired by Wilsonian self-determination to take their own fate into their hands. A mass meeting with representatives from 130 villages and towns in the area voted to form a government composed of an executive council and a national council. Thus, on December 5th, 1918, Lemko, the Lemko Rusin People's Republic came into existence led by a priest, Mikhail uh, Yukarevich, and a lawyer, Yaroslav uh, Kashmari. Their first order of business was to establish defense capabilities and schools. It is unclear what uh, territory the Lemko Republic actually administered on a day-to-day -day basis, but it was threatening enough to the burgeoning Polish state that the police arrested Kashmarik and the rest of the government in March 1920, putting an, an end to the existence of uh, the state. So it lasted for uh, about a year and a half. So that one was uh, a lasting one. Um, the location of this one. Okay. Um, another kind of Rousseauian Republic arose out uh, to the north out of the conflict between Poland and Lithuania uh, that my, my panel mate here, uh, Tomas Balkaris, uh, wrote about in his recent work. The village uh, Var Varvishki was occupied by Lithuanian troops um, in September 1919, uh, but they were not welcomed since the majority of the area was Polish speaking. According to some accounts, Lithuanian soldiers pillaged homes and attacked people, sparking them to form their own self-defense corps. 
Later on, as part of a ceasefire agreement between Poland and Lithuania, the village became part of a demilitarized zone. The self-government zone expanded during this period between 1920 and 1922, encompassing neighboring villages. A 1923 international agreement put the area, um, including Varmiški, under Lithuanian rule, which only formalized some of the local administration's activities. They started to produce their own uh, stamps and currency in an attempt to de facto become a Polish territory. Despite their continuous fighting with Lithuanian military and paramilitary, they ultimately lost and were absorbed into the Lithuanian state. Um, so the, the force of the Lithuanian state proved to be stronger than their vision. Okay. So through my investigation of these various microstates, I've been able to identify a few repeating patterns. Uh, the first set of patterns arising are the reasons why they appear in the first place. And in general, microstates arise either in the name of nationalism, as we can clearly see with Fenton, Barbiski, and the Ruthenian groups, or in the name of socialism, including but not limited to uh, Bolshevism. There were a number of Bolshevik or Bolshevik-inspired uh, examples of this phenomenon. Um, and probably the, the best known would be uh, the, the Slovak uh, Soviet Republic of 1919 um, that arose out of the Hungarian Red Army or the uh, provisional Polish Revolutionary Committee in Białystok, Polrewkom, uh, that was led by Felix Czerzyński and Jurien Machewski. Um, in Vilnius, of course, there were various competing socialist groups, uh, one Russian Bolshevik led by Kapsukas, and, uh, and one composed of various other groups, the uh, Vilnia uh, Soviet of Workers Deputies. Um, but perhaps less well known are the, um, the socialist kind of many, many states or micro states that, uh, that were not connected to, to Bolsheviks. So, for example, there was the, the People's Republic of Tranobzeg, uh, north of Krakow. Um, there, the, the town's traditional elites had, had taken over uh, toward the end of the war. And as a reaction, um, a, a bunch of uh, peasants actually kind of uh, took over and, uh, and formed their own government. This was more of like a radical uh, peasant socialism and not, not exactly uh, Bolshevism. North of, of Kielce, there was another uh, short-lived republic, the Pinchuk Republic, which was a socialist anarchist uh, kind of microstate. Um, and in the Dombrova uh, coal basin, where the Russian, German, and Austrian empires met before the start of World War I, was another site of a revolutionary uh, microstate, where communists and socialists happened to be the ones disarming the uh, German and Austrian armies in October and November, where they formed a, a Red Guard and People's Militia. Another set of patterns emerging from my research were the reasons why these microstates end so in the case of the above uh, socialist examples, they are destroyed militarily, mostly by a rising larger state force, such as Czechoslovakia or Poland. But there were many microstates that voluntarily joined a larger state, meaning that whole, uh, wholesale, the, the microstate administration simply became part of a larger network or a wider network and derived its authority uh, and power from a place further afield like Prague or Warsaw. Thus, decentralizing our understanding uh, so that the localities actually have agency in becoming part of these, these states. In that sense, the story of microstates is a different story of state building, not one that shows power emanating uh, from the capitals, but that consolidates local power into one system over a rather long period of time. To put this more succinctly, during the process of transition from empire to nation state in, in the post-World War I period, there were a number of claims and then counterclaims over the same territory. In the case of Poland and Czechoslovakia's state building, a closer investigation yields that the claims of sovereignty were absolutely necessary, as in the aforementioned Pressel Council uh, deciding the fate of Ruthenians to join Czechoslovakia. The case of Chechen is particularly illustrative of what I mean. There in the former Habsburg Duchy of Chechen, uh, two governments, one Czech and one Polish, were announced almost simultaneously in October 1918. 
These claims and counterclaims resulted in the Polish Czechoslovak War. The Polish local government had the upper hand at the beginning in establishing administration, but the Czechs were better equipped militarily and attacked in January 1919. The Polish National Council of the Duchy of Czechen, the local government, uh, was Poland's only claim on that territory. So when the issue was finally settled through allied intervention, it was this local claim of sovereignty, the local administration that had been set up that allowed Warsaw to claim the territory for itself. However, the local authority remained the actual government in the area until the question of Upper Silesia was, com uh, was completely settled in 1922. The same long protracted process played out in Western Poland uh, in the former Posen and Pomeranian provinces. Towns and cities um, claimed authority, in some cases battled German troops. A consolidated government for the region formed in Poznań and then became a part of Poland in August 1919, but not as integral provinces, but as a separate unit, the so-called former Prussian area that remained legally separate until April 1922. So here, as I wind down to the end, I think I'm doing well on time, so I can pat myself on the back. Um, we can fairly ask the question, did any of the microstates that I mentioned wield any uh, real power or sovereignty? And there are a couple of cases in which we can unequivocally say yes. Um, even if we have sparse, sparse evidence about what was actually happening on the ground, as this is a serious problem, uh, there are a few source documents for a lot of these things, but the reaction of the larger states around them, the way that they, tr they are treated, um, either to be destroyed or absorbed, shows the degree to which these claims of sovereignty were at least thought to be real. And on the question of whether or not they were legitimate, and therefore when they deployed violence or force, were they acting with legitimacy behind them? The answer there again must be yes. At the local level, we can see how participation in the formation of these microstates shows that they have the backing of the population to decide their own fates, to form Rousseauian republics to replace the former imperial powers or occupiers. To push this a step further, when the wishes of the local population and the wishes of the central government aligned, as in Chechen or the former uh, German lands of Western Poland, then the local people gave legitimacy to the nascent government in Warsaw. Of course, in 1918, uh, in November 1918, when a Polish state is declared in Warsaw, they only really controlled half of the occupation zone uh, of, of the Congress Poland, which would be a tiny fraction of what would become Poland after the process of state building was completed in 1922. So in that sense, the successor states can be understood as imperfect expressions of narrow sovereignty rather than the general will of the whole. Other localities, such as places where Ukrainians or Ruthenians formed a majority, needed to be absorbed by force. In places where microstates appear, the, uh, the competition between sovereignty claims becomes the source of violence rather than complete chaos or a lack of sovereign power. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Zachary, for a fascinating talk. Um, I also tap you on the back for great timekeeping. Um, ironically, I knew about the Schwenten Republic when, uh, since I was a kid, because the history buff I was uh, collecting historical atlases. There was one atlas where Schwenten was actually shown on a map in between Poland and Germany in very pink colors. I will send you a copy of that map, Zachary, that, for your reference, um, a German historical atlas from the 1980s. Um, so thank you very much. We move on uh, to Jagoda Pirzejska from the University of Warsaw. Jagoda is a um, historian of contemporary literature and culture with a keen focus on um, Galicia in the interwar years. She's adjunct prof at the Department of Literature of the 20 and 21st centuries. Um, at the Faculty of Polish Study at Warsaw. And she's also a principal investigator of an international research project entitled Multinational Eastern Galicia in the Interwar Polish Discourse. Um, and has, of course, published widely 
um, about Eastern Galicia and other subjects. One um, publication worth mentioning is entitled Continuities and Discontinuities of the Habsburg Legacy in East Central European Discourses since 1918, an edited volume. Um, Jagoda, thank you very much for joining us from Warsaw. The floor is yours. And your mic is off. Yes, it is. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this conference for making it, it real uh, or virtual, but uh, almost real. Uh, and for having me here, it's really a pleasure and honor to be with you and to have an opportunity to, uh, to talk about such interesting topics. Uh, now I will try to share my presentation, to share my screen. I hope you can see it. Uh, I hope uh, it's visible for or all of you. Uh, okay, uh, so um, I would like to invite you to um, reflection on and uh, to discursive analysis of Polish and Ukrainian propagandist campaigns, which sought to exaggerate and interpret in a specific manner mutual acts of violence committed by each national group. The propagandist campaigns, which were run during and immediately after the Polish-Ukrainian war for Eastern Galicia between 1918 and 1919. Please look at this little map on the screen. Uh, you can see um, here where the province of Eastern Galicia was situated. Of course, it was uh, part of the Habsburg Empire uh, before 1919 and uh, after the Polish-Ukrainian War, it became a part of the Second Polish Republic. This is the part of the map, which is green and pink. Uh, you can also see where the province of Galicia would be situated if it still existed. The red point uh, is, a city, is the city of Lviv, which is important. Uh, um, for me, because the most dramatic stage of the war, of the Polish-Ukrainian war, was the Battle of Lviv, um, which basically lasted six months. But uh, the but this this part of the of the battle, which took place on the Lviv streets, um, was between the first and the twenty second of November, nineteen nineteen. Uh, so uh, a few words about the structure of the paper. Uh, I will underline a tripartite antinomy which characterized that war. Initially, I will indicate the discrepancy between the relatively civilized institutional rules according to which the war developed and the acts of brutal violence committed by some participants of the war. Then I will focus on the Polish and Ukrainian propaganda involved in the conflict in Eastern Galicia. Propaganda which often had an institutional background, but simultaneously accused the enemy of atrocious war crimes, even more brutal than those um, committed in reality. It is striking that the Polish-Ukrainian uh, war was run with respect for some of the war laws and customs, at least uh, officially and at least in the initial stage. Warfare in the city area, I mean, in the area of Lviv, disrupted but didn't entirely stop uh, the activities of main municipal institutions. The national committees oversaw the waterworks and power station and ensured that supplies uh, reached the city. This is exactly what you can see on the photo on the screen. Um, these are food carts on Lviv streets in November 1918. From time to time, ceasefires were agreed to enable inhabitants to get out of houses and replenish food and fuel stocks. Negotiations between the warring sides continued almost until the end of the battle. After the battle, when Lviv was under Ukrainian siege for six months, the Ukrainians no longer allowed supplies to reach the city and, uh, and attempted to disrupt the water supply of Lviv inhabitants. Their artillery fire killed many civilians. 
all that time, the Poles treated the Galician Ukrainians as rebel citizens of Poland. Despite such circumstances, both Poland and Western Oblast of the Ukrainian People's Republic made an agreement of the, of the, on the 1st of November 1919 to respect the Hague and Geneva Conventions. All the attempts to regulate the conflict institutionally didn't change the fact that the Polish-Ukrainian war was brutal and violent. During the nine months of fights, 10,000 Polish soldiers and 15,000 Ukrainian soldiers lost their lives. However, the total number of casualties on both sides remains unknown. The Poles and the Ukrainians applied arrests, also mass arrests, of captured enemy fighters and civilians and often sent them to prisons and camps. Many of these people died of infectious diseases. Both Poles and Ukrainians gathered in paramilitary formations, often operating away from the decision-making center, cut off from regular supplies, therefore taking advantage of plunder. Victims of their violence were mainly civilians who represented various groups, primarily regard, um, regarded as representatives of hostile nationalities. But there are no doubts that the most rigid, rigid form of aggression against civilians during the war for Eastern Galicia was anti-Jewish violence. Murdering, raping, plundering, and devastating houses created every day a life of the Jewish community of the province. Pogroms with many afflicted also killed were organized in great numbers um, uh, of, on both sides of the Polish-Ukrainian front. The most atrocious slaughter was the three-day-long pogrom in Lviv from 22nd to 24th of November 1918. Uh, it was perpetrated by victorious Polish fighters and dwellers of Lviv immediately after the withdrawal of the Ukrainian soldiers from the city. The tension between the institutionalized and bottom-up war practices during the Polish-Ukrainian war was further complicated by the war's propagandist aspect. The accusations, um, and the, I'm sorry, the antagonists accused each other of violating the laws and customs of war like shooting medical patrols or killing hostages. However, already in early November 1918, they started to blame one another for much more atrocious crimes. Strikingly, they merged uh, early, earlier epoch metaphors describing enemies with what was considered modern science at the time. This way, the Poles and the Ukrainians joined the war of spirits, that is rivalry of antagonized reflections on the meaning and the goal of, of a military conflict, but also a role one's own nation played in it. Participants of the Polish-Ukrainian war of spirits uh, included intellectuals spontaneously reflecting on the, on the fights for Eastern Galicia, and more often miscellaneous people of letters, writers, journalists, and so on, who overtly or covertly served the state propaganda machine. Although there often stood serious authoritative institutions behind these people, they usually spread a specific information mix with, uh, in which realistic accusations merged with outrageous ex exaggerations. The initiative in the Polish-Ukrainian War of Spirits belonged to both national groups Daily Press, which described deeds of the enemy side in terms of barbarity and savagery. For example, the Polish wartime um, Lviv Daily, Pobudka, from the 10th of November, highlights the cruel behavior of Ukrainian soldiers, allegedly always drunk, towards Polish civilians, and finds the following parallel to the ongoing battle of Lviv. Quote, history repeats itself. The bloody times return when drunken Haidamak spans carouse in the Ukrainian steppes, end quote. In the same issue, there are two more texts that describe the 
carousing savages, this is of course a quotation, and there, this is also a quotation, animal deeds in Lviv. In turn, the Ukrainian daily, Dilo, informed its reader about the dreadful behavior of Polish soldiers towards Ukrainians. The author of the article from the 13th of November summarizes, quote, Obviously, such an enemy doesn't obey the most elementary rules accepted between militant, militant cultural sides, end quote. While the same, the same author regards the Polish ranks as gangs, the author of the text from the 15th of November uses much stronger words. The latter calls Poles bandits and openly blames them for barbarism. Higher potential than press for arousing anti-Ukrainian and anti-Polish moods had brochures and books, which incited longer public discussions. On the Polish side, such power held the speech given during a session of the parliament in Warsaw and published in 1919 by Jan Zamorski, a politician of the National Democracy and the head of the Parliamentary Investigation Committee established in 1919 to inquire into, this is a quotation, Heidemax crimes. Please look at the screen. Here you can see the front page of this document of the speech given by Zamorski. The politician claimed that Ukrainian Heidemax had committed the most outrageous offenses towards the Polish civilians in Eastern Galicia including unlikely sexual crimes, which aroused deep indignation of listeners in the parliament hall. According to Zamorski, not only did the Ukrainians torture people, burn them alive in their houses or bury alive or half alive, they also captured Polish girls for public houses for soldiers, collectively raped them and then murdered in an extremely perverse way. Zamorski summarizes such revelations by particularly accusing Ukrainian nationalists, called by him half-intellectuals, of the most perverse crimes. This way, he, he emulates a distinct tendency in the Polish discourse to divide Ukrainians into a group of aggressive nationalists and the rest of the folk, Ruthenians, ethnically related and reportedly loyal to Poles. This was a tendency rooted in the ideology of Polish superiority in Galicia and Poles' denial of Ukrainians' existence as a separate nation. A similar anti-Ukrainian character as Zamorski's speech appeared in other publications that claimed to be fully reliable documents. Uh, one of them is Władysław Orobkiewicz's book from 1919 with an explicit subtitle, which I will read in English only. The main title means why, and the subtitle um, is as follows. Rapes and barbarity committed towards the Polish uh, soldiers and the population of the Eastern part of the former Austrian partition and their sources. Orobkiewicz enumerates several sensations like the following one. In November 1918, on Żukiewska Street in Lviv, Ukrainian soldiers undressed a, a young boy, forced him to dance naked and ultimately scalped. According to Orobkiewicz, quote, the witness hidden in a nearby tenant house was unable to stand the view and run away, end quote from the repetition of fabricated information of that kind didn't refrain even Czesław Mączyński, the commander in chief of the Polish forces during the Battle of Lviv. Although his memoirs from 1921 should belong to historiography, he repeats unreliable images of bestial murders committed by the Ukrainians and quote, hundreds of victims, completely, completely innocent, regardless of age and sex, from babies to old women, end quote. The Ukrainian reaction to such insinuations appeared in a few publications, often originally written, written in on, or translated into foreign languages for better publicity and propaganda effect. 
one of them was, um, and probably the most significant one, was Krofawa Knicha, published in Czech language in 1920. According to the subtitle, Krofawa Knicha was dedicated to the meticulous documentation of the, quote, Polish occupation of the Ukrainian territory of Galicia from 1918 till December 1919. The most extensive part of the book was about the murder of Ukrainian civilians. It enumerated 86 separate sites in Eastern Galicia where atrocious crimes were to have occurred. For example, in a village near Sambor, the Polish soldiers were to badly hurt three Ukrainian women with sabers and then bury them still alive. The book also includes information on scandalous murders believed to have been committed by the Poles in Lviv. Except for the brutal, torture-like killing of wounded soldiers, the Polish fighters were said to have killed or raped the juvenile Ukrainian civilians in the city and its vicinity. Simultaneously with victim's young age, the book often underlines the social status, which suggests that the Poles tried to destroy the Ukrainian intelligentsia. Another publication that pointed at Polish atrocities in Eastern Galicia and had an overtly propagandist goal was the Ukrainian memorandum from 1919, written by Vladimir Temnitsky and Josef Buraczynski, and addressed to Georges Clemenceau, the president of the Paris Peace Conference. You can see the front page uh, of the memorandum on the screen. The document protests against the, uh, the authorization of Poland's temporary administration in Eastern Galicia and seeks to show that the main source of threats in the region are the Poles, especially the, un the undisciplined and demoralized Polish military units and bands of different kind. Tamnitsky and Buraczynski accused um, the Polish soldiers of, quote, the most diabolical cruelties. Um, among others, notorious rapes of Ukrainian women and girls, even 12 years uh, year olds, and the barbarian torment of Ukrainian peasants, including gouging out their eyes, beating and starving them to death. The authors of the document claim that Polish atrocities were equal, quote, with the bar barbarous cruelties perpetrated in the Balkans and Armenia, end quote. Some of them, they argue, this is quotation again, have uh, even surpassed those historical crimes, especially the mistreatment of adolescents, for example, grabbing Ukrainian children and hurling them alive into flames. These crimes were to, were to occur frequently in numer numerous spots in Eastern Galicia. Mutual Polish-Ukrainian war um, accusations, especially um, when referring to such historical phenomena as the Haidamaka movement or Serbdom oppression of Ukrainian peasants by Polish lords, revealed layers of deep-rooted, long-lasting grudges that both nationalities held against each other. If we take such circumstances into account, the accusations in question appear as big manifestations of the ethnicization process, which was weakening the Habsburg monarchy since the first half of the 19th century. In Galicia, the, the ethnicization revealed uh, itself in the form of a polylateral Polish, Ukrainian, and Jewish conflict. In the late 19th and early 20th century, the Polish-Ukrainian dimension of that conflict resemble in discursive terms, of course, the preliminary stage of the war of spirits that both nationalities conducted later in the wake of the military conflict for Eastern Galicia. After the clash of the Habsburg monarchy, the Polish-Ukrainian war of spirits showed its proper violence. Moreover, it revealed new threads which merged with the anti-Ukrainian and anti-Polish stereotypes and metaphors from the past. These threads ensued from new ideas considered 
to have been scientific at that time. They found their discursive patterns on Western fronts of the First World War and made the, Galician, the, Galician, the Eastern Galician War of Spirits into a truly modern phenomenon. According to a convincing argument of Maciej Górne, a Polish historian, the description of outrageous crimes that, that, Polish, that Poles and Ukrainians really or allegedly committed towards representatives of the antagonistic nation, nation constituted a testimony to the Eastern reception of the Western propaganda developed in the course of the First World War. World War. This was particularly evident in uh, uh, accounts of sexually motivated atrocities against females and adolescents. In 1914, um, the French, British and Belgian propaganda found per perpetrators of the same, usually faked cruelties in the Germans. The Entente propagandists sought to dehumanize the Germans and described them as bloodthirsty barbarians. Simultaneously, they analyzed the Germans' crimes in ethnopsychological terms. The latter phenomenon consisted of hyperbolizing deeds of enemies in order to make general statements aspiring to the rank of objectivity and science about presumed worst possible mental and moral condition of enemies as a nation. The father of such an optic was the French Henri Bergson, shortly followed by the German Werner Sombart, who tried to oppose the Entente propagandists' calumny. The Polish and Ukrainian authors run their variant of War of Spirits first since 1915 against Russia. However, during the later Polish-Ukrainian war and after when tensions between the Poles and Ukrainians remained, clashes between the two national groups in 1918-1919 constituted one of the best fields for generalizations of, the, of their mutual national characters for both. Such authors as Zamorski and Orobkiewicz on the Polish side or Temnicki and Buraczyński on the Ukrainian side accused their military antagonists of barbarian deeds and at the same time essentialized these deeds, presenting them as manifestations of allegedly inherent, bar uh, barbary, uh, inherent barbarism of the antagonistic national group. This way, all of them sought to show their enemies not only as perpetrators of savage acts, but first of all, as savage people, outcasts from the circle of civilized nations, and consequently those who, have, who could have no right to take control over Eastern Galicia and look after its population. The Polish and Ukrainian propaganda of violence was not a sensational addition to the war for Eastern Galicia. Uh, these are conclusions. Quite the opposite. It consisted of the conflict's important and complicated aspect, which, uh, which functioned, functioned in between the institutional frameworks of the Polish-Ukrainian war and brutal deeds of its uh, participants, often without the control of their commanders. On the one hand, both fighting sides, um, both fighting sides propagandist activities were supported by, by influential, more or less, institutions and often aimed to influence the Paris Peace Conference. On the other hand, even if the Polish and Ukrainian propagandists uh, texts accused the opponents of fabricated offenses, they had a real power to incite revenge and consequently to escalate the struggle and the war. The Polish and Ukrainian propaganda of violence after 1918 combined the motives present in the long lasting tumultuous discussion of Poles and Ukrainians in Habsburg, Galicia. Though with new threads, the new threads embraced not only charges that resembled, that, uh, resembled those that Western propagandists 
had raised against their enemies during the First World War, but they especially embraced the essentialization of charges as manifestations of an innate character of the enemy nation. According to the essentialist reasoning, the more barbarian deeds, real or imagined, doesn't really matter, the opponents did, the more barbarian they were and the less they deserved power over a given territory. In the case of the Polish-Ukrainian war, the goal of propagandists on of both sides was not just to highlight who suffered more in the, in the fight for the province. First of all, they sought to show the antagonistic national group as Eastern Galicia's a barbarian invader or occupant who perpetrated monstrosities in the region, while their own group was Eastern Galicia's true host, whose national territory should have embraced the contentious land for the benefit of all its inhabitants. Thus, we may say that the restoration of mutual Polish and Ukrainian accusations, stereotypes, and bias known from previous centuries with new discursive strategies, especially the ethno-psychological one, transformed the Polish-Ukrainian propagandist campaigns in the wake of the war for Eastern Galicia into a phenomenon typical for the epoch of nation states and triumph of the principle of nationality. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jagoda, for a fascinating talk. And thank you also for the nicest background of the day. I love your typewriter um, on your back. Um, so um, yeah, that was fascinating. And I myself will follow up on this uh, tomorrow in my very own talk, because I will also kind of discuss how um, the dissatisfaction with the Versailles or the Paris uh, order um, led to sort of an anti-Paris discourse in, in Europe and violence, of course, is an important part of the picture. And so you um, very nicely highlighted the international or uh, transnational impact um, of, the, of the propaganda. I would like to add maybe um, that uh, Jewish papers also reported widely on the, on the uh, pogroms of Lviv. I was uh, lately reading Jewish newspapers from Munich and they, they really cover the Lviv pogroms uh, quite extensively. Our next speaker of the day uh, is Thomas Balkelis from the Lithuanian Institute of history in uh, Vilnius. He's a research fellow at the very same institute, having received his PhD in history at Toronto. Um, and his most important, or some of his most important publications include The Making of Modern Lithuania with Routledge and Revolution and Nation Making in Lithuania with um, 1914 to 1923 with Oxford University Press. Thomas, thank you very much for joining us. Nice to see you again, the floor is yours. Oh, and your talk of course is entitled The Logic of Violence in the Polish-Lithuanian Conflict, 1920 to 1923. So a nice continuation of, we, of what we just heard. Hello everyone, I'm very happy to be with you. This is probably the first conference that I'm attending after the pandemic, and it's really such a joy to be uh, back to the normal life. It's not a, a physical conference, but still, you know, I, I hope I will come back to Vienna and we will meet face to face. So I would like uh, to start uh, right away with sharing uh, my screen and uh, my slides. There, there won't be too many. I will, I will, I will show the slides primarily for the purposes of, uh, for the purpose of showing some maps and also some photographs. Um, but uh, uh, most of my presentation will be uh, my uh, my reading, uh, not my reading, but my uh, text that I prepared here. So um, my paper deals. Just want to make sure that. You can see the slides. Can you see the slides? Okay. Yeah. 
Here we are. So my paper deals with violence that took place between 1920 and 1923 in Lithuania, or to be more precise, in eastern part of Lithuania, in the region of Vilnius, mostly. Um, it, it took place during the extension of the Polish-Lithuanian War. Thus, uh, for those of you who are not very familiar with this, um, with this period of time, if the regular war between Poland and Lithuania starts in the spring of 1919 and finishes uh, with a truce medi mediated by the League of Nations in November 1920, uh, after that, uh, we have the irregular war, as I call it, dirty war, that continues until the spring of 1923. So I'm, I'm talking about this post-war actually period, about this period of, di of dirty war. And um, this is the time when the, when the League of Nations uh, establishes uh, so-called the, the, the neutral zone or demilitarized zone between Poland and Lithuania. And uh, the zone existed from November 1920 until February 1923. And in March 1923, uh, with the mediation of the League of Nations, it was turned into administrative border between the two states. But of course, Lithuania did not accept this border. You know, Lithuanians called it only a demarcation line. So the conflict was not over. So I'm focusing here, you know, on those three years. And um, so why the zone is created, the, the neutral zone is created in the first place. It is an attempt by the League of Nations to prevent the direct contact between the Polish and Lithuanian troops. So in November 1920, both sides agreed to pull their armies six kilometers back from the current front line. In this way, the neutral zone is created. And here you have two maps. Uh, the one on the, on the left in, in French is the map used by the League of Nations at some point. And the other one is, a, is kind of Lithuanian map. And you can see on, on this Lithuanian map, the wide, long, strap of territory, you know, uh, cutting Lithuania into two pieces. So I'm talking about this wide strap. I'm talking about the, the zone, which is about 400 kilometers long, 12 kilometers wide, and had the size of about 4,000 square kilometers. But there were about 30,000 people living there. Uh, as we know, the area, the zone, immediately became the epicenter of irregular ethnic violence that involved civilians. Uh, numerous paramilitary fighters were trained locally as well as sent and supported by national governments of Poland and Lithuania. The dirty nature of this conflict is evident in the widespread use of terror by both sides. That included summary ex executions, torture, kidnappings, population displacement, hostage and ransom taking, as well as pillaging, robberies, and destruction of private property. I will talk about these reforms a little bit later. Uh, what is my theoretical take here? I aim to explore the logic of violence in, of this conflict using some uh, theoretical insights from Status Kaliva. So uh, I don't know if some people pronounce Kalibus. From his well-known study uh, written in 2006, The Logic of Violence in Civil War. His major insight that I'm drawing from, from his uh, excellent book is that violence should be analytically decoupled from war. In civil wars, violence may have its own logic and most importantly to me, shape the behavior and identities of belligerents and, civilians, and civilian populations. So I will focus on the question whether the irregular violence can be seen as nation-making tool used by both sides in the disputed and ethnically mixed area. Also, I will ask whether this violent way of nation making was efficient, was it successful or not? I will study the forms, dynamics, and functions of violence and its perpetrators by focusing on the experiences of civilians and their ethnic identities in the neutral zone. Uh, my sources were both Polish and Lithuanian accounts of atrocities and memoirs of paramilitary fighters uh, different press reports and, and official documents of the League of Nations and Polish and Lithuanian governments. The first question, uh, which, which is worth asking, I think, is 
This is the case of civil war in the first place. Kalivas, like most other specialists, consider by civil war, quote, I'm quoting Kalivas, an armed combat within the boundaries of a recognized sovereign entity between parties subject to a common authority at the outset of the hostilities, end of quote. Formally speaking, it was not a civil war since the neutral zone did not have a common authority and was not a recognized sovereign entity. It was rather a temporary solution to appease the interstate conflict, a sort of no man's land with no government. However, the conflict had several key features that allow us to study it as civil war, and I, I will point them out. First of all, there was non-conventional warfare happening in, in this conflict in the neutral zone, and it is very common to most other civil wars. Secondly, the civilian population in the zone experienced uh, the conflict as civil war bec because of the high levels of terror and because they be become primary targets of, 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 of this violence. Thirdly, the region was never divided by any state borders before. So it, it, it was a very peaceful region for, for many centuries. So this border is this kind of new construct that is dividing uh, communities that used to live together for, for, for ages. And fourthly, the zone displayed fragmented sovereignty common to civil wars. It was fragmented because two political actors exercised limited sovereignty over the same part of the territory. So um, let me look now at specific ethnic and social profile of this region, of, of this neutral zone. First of all, of course, you know, it needs to be mentioned, it is historically highly multi-ethnic area. Uh, and uh, if you look at a couple of maps here, for example, this is the, uh, a map made by Polish scholar Zwadowski in 1914. And th this red line shows uh, where, the, the, where Lithuanians are residing. So if, if you look, you know, in this area, there are some pockets of Lithuanians living in contemporary Belarus. But it, you also notice that around the Vilnius, there is a kind of salient where Lithuanian population is, 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 is not in, in the majority. Uh, so um, you have basically Lithuanians uh, living uh, in uh, the northern and southern part of the zone, while the central area, area, area around Vilnius is very highly um, po po Polish and also of course, there, are, there is a substantial population of Jews, about 30%. Here you have the spread of Polish language, uh, a map of 1931 made by a Polish scholar Eberhard. It basically, I think both maps correspond showing, you know, how the settlement of the Polish population and the Lithuanian population. So you have, uh, in some places, the majority of Lithuanians. In the Vilnius region, you have the majority of Poles. Then you have Jews living pretty much everywhere. Uh, about 30% of population. And then you have the Belarusian population, which is a uh, minority, but they also uh, live, you know, all over this area. So um, let's look at this cleavages, uh, kind of pre-war cleavages, which are very important here, I think, because we have to kind of understand the roots of this violence that are these roots old? Is it something that started happening, let's say, in the 19th century, or is it something that uh, happened only as a result of the Great War and, and the revolution and, and state building in the area in the, in the early 20th century? So interestingly, we have some evidence of the pre-war ethnic Lithuanian-Polish conflict in this area. So from the 1880s, there were numerous cases of fights between Polish and Lithuanian Catholic peasants over the use of their respective languages in churches in the former Tsarist Suwalki and Vilna provinces. This early, early conflict clearly shows the growing nationalization of masses, but it can be hardly compared to the extent of violence that erupts in the 1920s. I think, you know, I, I, I'm still arguing, you know, that uh, the Great War, the German occupation and the, the coming of the Red Army and the Russian Revolution are those forces that produced high levels of violence in this area, not this cultural battle between Poles and Lithuanians. Though, of course, we have to think that uh, this conflict, you know, uh, is a, is, serves as a background for what will, will happen later. Uh, 
The other important point is that many researchers of this region, they point out that at the time, uh, it was almost impossible to distinguish between a Pole and a Lithuanian in this Polish-Lithuanian borderland. As we know, a large section of population were Catholic peasants who identified themselves as so-called Tuteshi uh, locals and spoke language which was described uh, as poprostu or, or simple language. And those people, they're still around. I will talk about them at the end of my presentation. Another pre-existing uh, local cleavage, I think, which is very important for understanding this uh, violence uh, that will erupt among, among the population was the social division between the Polish speaking nobility that owns the majority of land in the area and Lithuanian and Slavic speaking peasantry of whom the majority are either landless or smallholders. So th there is this you know, social tension in, in the region. And I'm jumping now to my key argument. My, I, 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 will, I, will, I will argue here that violence effectively became a nation-making instrument that forced the local people into two hostile networks of self-support. Even those people who do not have clearly cut national identities, thus visible markers of identity such as language and ethnicity turned the civilians into expected targets and they were forced to coalesce around their respective groups because of security considerations. In this case, violence may be considered as a critical community building element. However, uh, the process of forced nationalization was limited and may have resulted in the emergence of indifferent, um, indifference among certain groups of population. I'm referring here to, to the Tutation, and I will, I, I will talk about them later. So let's look firstly about, uh, at the agents of violence. And here you have just two pictures. The first side is the Polish side. So since the both, since both regular armies, uh, Polish and, and, and Lithuanian armies are not allowed to enter the zone, Lithuanians form their own paramilitary troops, so-called Shole, the riflemen, and they also called partisans, while the Poles create their own uh, uh, militia, Ludova Pasa Neutralnego, the Polish police of the neutral zone. What is interesting, both sides labeling each other as partisans, which is indication that uh, they're trying to delegitimize de 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 you know, the opponents by saying that they are kind of illegal fighters and we are the legal uh, uh, um, fighters in this area. The majority of members of both militias were local men, very often World War I and independence war veterans. Nevertheless, occasionally Poland and Lithuania was used to send their regular troops dressed up as civilians. The, the paramilitaries were supplied by regular armies. Both sides had small guns, but also some of them had machine guns, grenades, and even mine throwers. Um, what were their numbers? Uh, they, they, they matched pretty much equally, I would say. There were about 60,000 Polish militia members and about four or 5,000 Lithuanian Shaolay or partisans. Um, the hottest places of conflict were not around Vilnius, but uh, in the northeast, in the area of um, uh, Shervintos, uh, not very visible actually, maybe here, and Gedraice, and also in the southeast, in, in, in the places like Ludvinavas, Perloja, and Vervishkis, the place that Zachary mentioned in his, in his paper. Um, interestingly, those were the places where the numbers of Tutesi were very low. Those were the places where the Lithuanians and Poles resided in close proximity to each other. I think this is very important. What was the nature of these militias? Well, uh, I think they were primarily political rather than military institutions because they were part of a strategy of local rule and state building. Although they were formed to engage primarily in so-called protective violence, meaning you know, self-defense, they often meted out predatory and abusive violence, including extortion. I'm, I'm, I'm using these terms, uh, predatory and abusive violence uh, taken from Kalivas. Their reputation for atrocity was well established. In, in the conflict, there was a rapid escalation in violence because the militias used their power to fight personal and local conflicts as well. Uh, let's look at the types of violence uh, that happened there. 
The most popular type of violence, of course, uh, are requisitions, robberies, and pillaging. They happen because the militias are feeding themselves as local people. Interestingly, they are paid by the Lithuanian government, uh, and uh, the Polish militia is also paid by the government of uh, Litva Shrotkova in middle Lithuania. But uh, the, this, 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 these robberies and pillaging, I think they intended to they have a clear intent to destroy the property of ethnic enemies. It's not only about uh, gaining their goods. And, and um, the second most important, most popular form of violence that happens is the destruction of uh, physical properties, arson. So you have many cases of burnings. Uh, they happen on, uh, on both sides. So the Lithuanians, for example, attack the village of Varvishka is the one that uh, was mentioned already in the spring of 1923, and they basically burned the entire village. The village is destroyed. It, it's, it's totally wiped out. Um, it's a Polish village. And also you have socially oriented attacks on the Polish estates in the neutral zone. This, for example, in November 1923, Lithuanians burned the estate of Polish landlord near Dukstos. In the fall of 1921, there, there is a number uh, of attacks uh, against Polish states in, in Rakeche and, uh, and uh, often the landlords, the Polish landlords and their family members are shot during these burnings. And uh, of course, these arsons and robberies often lead to ethnic cleansing in the form of exodus of people who found themselves in a hostile environments. So uh, in early 1923, the Polish press is reporting that some Poles are moving away from, the, from this violent zone near Gedraici. And the same is happening on the Lithuanian side. Some Lithuanian farmers are buying properties in independent Lithuania and moving away from, from the zone of violence. Uh, now I want to look... we have to slowly uh, move towards the end. Okay, so um, yes, so I'm, I'm gonna, you know, I, I'm gonna skip a, a, a descriptions of this violence, uh, beatings, torture, mutilations, summary executions, and hostage taking, revenge attacks against attacks against the others. I wanted to kind of show you what what's happening. It's a very gruesome story, so I'm not gonna go into the detail. Uh, I will talk very briefly now about uh, the responses of civilians. So you have, of course, armed resistance. Zahari mentioned, you know, these republics, so-called uh, mi microstates. So there are at least two of them in the zone, one in Varvishkis, the other one is on the Lithuanian side. Then you have massive complaints of local people sent to the national governments and also to the League of Nations. They're asking their villages to be joined to one state or the other. And of course, you know, uh, just a very brief note about the role of governments. Uh, the governments are interfering into the conflict because the militias are their proxies, they're supporting them. At the same time, the governments are scared and afraid of this violence because it brings disorder and the trying to avoid another open war, especially the Lithuanian side. So there is an attempt to calm down the situation and that's why the neutral zone finally is disbanded it's, it's abolished by, by the decision of the League of Nations. There is a violent conflict over its division. And uh, finally, I'm, I think I'm just jumping to my conclusion here. And uh, I'll, I'll repeat, you know, myself that here, that in the zone violence is an essential na nation making tool that forces people to take sides and adopt national identities. However, just a brief note about the tutation and I finish here. First of all, um, Interestingly, the Teishi, they're still here. Uh, uh, the, the census of 2011 in Lithuania showed that in Vilnius, in the Vilnius region, there are 17,000 people who refused to disclose, to indicate their national identity. And I, I assume, you know, those, most of these people, they are Tutashi. And um, Lithuania never recognized the Tutashi as any kind of ethnic group. While in Poland in 1931, there were about 700,000 of them. So I'm, I'm leaving this presentation with this kind of a hypothetical uh, statement, question. It's, it's not any kind of conclusion that I, I want to point out, but I think it remains to be seen to what extent this indifference of people like Tutashi is part of, the, of their pre-modern identities or a political response to the violent efforts of nation-making. 
that we that we wit witness in the region. So I'm leaving this with this open question and thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Thomas, very much for your talk and thank you to all the three of you for really brilliant timekeeping. It's funny, Thomas, how um, how we all use uh, status cadavers and his a very grammarly um, approach to study study um, civil wars. I think that's that's really the charm uh, of um, of his uh, approach. This sort of systematic grammarly um, approach that makes it so easy for us to um, translate it it's to whether it's Lithuania in your case or Croatia in my case, and, and many many other colleagues have done so. There should be a comparative conference on this one day soon. I I I, I would suggest. Um, without much ado, um, we don't have much time for discussion, unfortunately, so I would like to ask everybody to keep their questions uh, short and crisp, and I would also like to ask the speakers to, to um, answer in all possible brevity, and the first question comes from Tim Corbett. Tim, uh, nice just one, you here. Yeah. Uh, Thomas, can you end your presentation, please? That would be great. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, I have to stop sharing. Sorry about that. Tim. Okay, maybe later. Um, please raise your hands. Um, and if not, I will will start with a little question. I have one for Jagoda and one for Zachary, starting with you, Zach. Um, great approach, of course. I was wondering, though, first of all, um, most of the cases you discussed and most of the cases of, of local autonomy are really sort of on a village level and, and not so much on a regional level. We have discussed um, such attempts or failed attempts for the Bukovina yesterday uh, for a little bit, but can you maybe think of, of um, uh, well, um, attempts to, to, to gain autonomy on a more regional level? And secondly, you mentioned the um, the Husul and the um, Lemk cases, and there I was wondering um, whether they actually not don't fall out of those categories that you have discussed, such as the, the, the well, the cities sort of in between or the villages in between, because that's more um, sort of tribal cases for or um, ethnically inspired. I hope um, Tara Sara is not listening, uh, but uh, such cases for for gaining autonomy. So yeah, you're right that um, most of what I'm talking about is sort of at the village or the town or city level. Um, and the Lemko Republic is an example of more of a regional development. But so that's a, I think that's an open question. Could you say that it's regional or is it ethnic? Um, and was the, the movement in each individual village to form a, an autonomous government, was that really, um, was that really inspired by some kind of ethnic identity or was it really about holding off somebody else? Like we don't want to join the, the West Ukrainian Republic or we don't want to join Poland um, in that sense. Um, but there, there weren't many, many examples of, uh, of kind of a regional autonomy. I think where you see that, um, that carved out, those, the regions carved out, they were mostly holding on to territory to join a larger state. So this is something that we see in Czechoslovakia, something that we see in the state building process in, in Poland. Um, I don't know if there are examples of this in Hungarian. Uh, I, don't, I don't read Hungarian, so I don't have access to a lot of those sources, but I imagine that there are cases of this, for example, in Transylvania, where people were trying to hold on to Hungarian rule in Transylvania uh, against all odds, kind of. Uh, against the, the will of, of the, the allies. So I hope that's concise enough an answer for you. Mm, thank you very much. Maybe um, also uh, leaving our world of East and Central Europe and looking at more Western European cases might might be good cases for, of comparison, or even Germany, um, the Bavarian Soviet Republic, for instance, in 1919 had a strong sort of um, autonomous 
uh, touch uh, to it. I will postpone my question to Yagoda and continue with the audience. We will collect uh, two questions now. First is Gabor and second is uh, our very own Thomas. Gabor. So Thomas, we will start with you. Yes, I, I would like to jump into discussion with uh, Zahari. I, I really enjoyed your, your presentation. You did excellent work, you know, displaying the variety of these microstates, and there were different types of them. Uh, but at some point, you suggested, you know, that uh, some of them, um, they had kind of strong ideological foregrounding, and they were either nas nationalist oriented or socialist oriented. And I was and in, in my own research, I, I, when I was studying, you know, kind of the cases of uh, in Lithuania, in Lithuania, there were about oh, okay. at, at least four or five, you know, these micro states, you know, uh, uh, the states that can be described as to, to a certain extent sovereign. I realized that um, most of them, they did not have any ideological foreground, or it was absolutely situational. So, for example, I can give you an example of this uh, Lithuanian village Perloja, which is not far away from Varvishki, by the way. And so when, when they claim to be a uh, Perloyan Republic, and they have a self-defense band organized by Great War veterans, when the Red Army comes over, they declare to the Red Army that they are a revolutionary committee, that they are supporting the Red government, and they are left alone. When the, when the Lithuanian army comes, comes in later, then they say, we are patriots of Lithuania. So, I mean, they are absolutely uh, opportunists in their approach. And I think, you know, their primary motivation of existence is not really ideological. It's about control of local resources and about self-defense. Because, for example, some of these microstates, they are at the crossroads of, 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 of moving troops. You have uh, the German army still withdrawing, you know, you have the Polish troops around pillaging, you have the Bolsheviks, you know, walking around pillaging, you have the Lithuanian regular army coming over, and it's about controlling uh, the monopoly in, of violence in your little village or town, I think. It's much more important than any kind of ideology for those people. But later, of course, it changes because you have to choose sides because they're not able to contend with these, you know, irregular armies. So, so this is kind of my critical remark to what you said. But I, 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 I don't make this claim to all the cases because, of course, there are some cases in, in which I think you are totally right. Just my comment. Great. Thank, thank you very much. And I'll ask that you write the name of that village in the in the chat, that'd be yes, great. I will. Thank you. Okay, uh, Gabor, you should now be able to. Okay. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I will uh, ask questions from Zachary Mazur. I think it's very fascinating uh, what you presented, and uh, it gave me a lot of ideas, and that's what I will try to formulate, or at least uh, comment on, leading to in a way that leads to questions. So uh, the first uh, I would like to ask is uh, how you would consider as a potential other factor of the state making, micro state making localism, age or local claims that people, locals for certain reasons think that right at that moment is the best way to resolve through acquiring state because in certain cases, one can find uh, centuries old material issues that they consider unresolved, like was the case in some Hungarian Yaskun uh, uh, so-called uh, Republic or others. So that could be an interesting uh, issue. Uh, I think there are a few which one can claim a kind of diplomatically established microstates. Uh, Maybe Upper Silesia under Antent control is one case, and there is definitely one in the Banat, the Lugoj County, which was established by the French occupiers and run by the Hungarian counter-revolutionary government with its seat in Arad. So that's really a fascinating uh, microstate there, but that's also a different statehood, I think. Uh, another issue can be 
Uh, you focus on violence and the legi use of legitimate violence and how it constitutes sovereignty, but uh, maybe there is another issue in play there in these some of these uh, cases. Uh, I would argue that in the case of the Banat Republic, the leaders of this republic never really wanted to have the monopoly of violence on the territory that was under Serbian occupation anyways. But rather, what they wanted to use as the core of their statehood was welfare institutions. And that could be connected very well with the wartime developments regarding what constitutes state citizenship, whatever. So probably that's also something that you could comment on. And, uh, and the last one is uh, whether these microstates only reveal that kind of classic unitary sovereignty or something about how this period is also experimenting with new forms of statehood. If you think of how some of these microstates were supposed to be integrated into larger states through federalism or through these council systems that one can argue is some kind of uh, following the example of Russia, revolutionary Russia, not necessarily Bolshevik Russia, then it's also, uh, federalism or alternatives to this unit form statehood that would be in play here to a certain extent. So, thank you. Great, thank, thank you very much. I, I won't respond to your questions because they're, they're too complicated to respond to. So uh, I will just thank you very much for all the thoughts. I'm gonna take them and, and, uh, and absorb them and, and start to mold them over. So I really appreciate it. Speaking of uh, Hungary, Eva Kovac, just brought the uh, cherries from Hungary, real Hungarian cherries. They are very sour, but very tasty too. Um, so my, I have a question for um, Jagoda as announced that my question is um, Jews being caught so, so often in between uh, the fronts and, and, and the violent attacks after um, a bilicit, bilicit, um, well, of the, of the civil war parties. And, um, during the Second World War in, in Volinia, um, often on a local level, um, Jewish-Polish alliances would emerge who defend themselves together against uh, Ukrainian nationalists' attacks in their villages. So Jewish partisans, Holocaust survivors, basically, and, and Polish villagers team up together, which is, of course, a fascinating microhistory. And I was wondering if anything similar occurs in Lviv in, in 19... Uh, 18, just the other way around, that sort of uh, Polish anti-Semitic violence leads to sort of uh, Jewish-Ukrainian micro-alliances in the city of Lviv or in, in, in other, other cities you came across. Uh, thank you very much for this question. Uh, actually, it's a fascinating topic and uh, it, it really makes the whole picture much more complicated. Um, in fact, I uh, focused only on this Polish-Ukrainian propagandist campaigns, but this is definitely true that Jews were the first uh, part and side of all this conflict and all this drama that took place uh, in in Lviv and the whole region. Uh, so that's that's the that's the first word I, I would say. Um, also to comment your um, your words said um, and after immediately after my presentation. So um, I would begin with that uh, fact that the, the Lviv pogrom um, really um, aroused a very complicated Polish Jewish propagandist campaign. That was that was that was that, that was the first stage of all this of, of, of all this um, let's say let's say multi uh, international drama. Yes, yeah, so uh, so um, uh, in fact, Poles accused. Jews of violent, violating neutrality, which they, uh, which Jews declared uh, um, uh, at, the, at the very beginning of the of the of the war, and Jews, uh, that's also true, tried to um, exaggerate the number of casualties of the pogrom. So uh, that conflict, uh, I, I, I'm I'm sorry for the for the barking in the background. This is my dog, which is uh, perhaps supporting me. I'm very very sorry for that. I I I hope you don't see uh, hear it. I can hear it. Um, 
so uh, I, so I, I will go on with, with with my answer. So this um, uh, to make to make it short short um, this uh, propagandist campaign poll, between Poles and uh, Jews uh, lasted for the whole inter uh, interwar period till the 1939, uh, where much more dramatic. Um, uh, uh, events started to take place. And as for uh, the Ukrainian side, um, it's true, Ukrainians tried to use this uh, circumstances, uh, uh, the fact that the, the, it, it, that the Polish side, Polish soldiers and Polish civilian, Polish citizens of the city um, perpetrated the pogrom. So, so the Ukrainian side tried to use it. For example, there were a number of uh, articles in Ukrainian press which uh, declared that Jews um, sided with Ukrainians, supported uh, the Ukrainian uprising, as it was uh, called in the press. But but uh, it's very difficult uh, to because uh, what what I'm talking about now it's the level of propaganda it's the level of uh, discourse it would be very hard to find uh, examples of real cooperation between uh, Jews and Ukrainians but on the other hand it's true that on the Ukrainian um, on the Ukrainian uh, part of the border I mean in the um, in, the, in this part of Ukraine, which was uh, behind the Zbruch River, uh, the number of pogroms was, was uh, a little bit lower. So that's and uh, additionally, Ukrainians declared that they uh, accept um, Jews as a nation, as a nationality. They accepted um, Jewish na nationality and they accepted uh, the rights, uh, the national rights of, of Jews. So this made um, Jews much more eager to, uh, to, 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 to support uh, uh, the Ukrainian side of all this conflict. But of course, as I said, we have to distinguish between the, uh, between the, um, the discursive aspect yes of this conflict and discursive uh, examples of uh, parting uh, sides uh, one side with another and uh, we have to think in a little bit different um, di different um, a little bit differently about what was going on on the field, on the ground, yes, in in, re, in, in villages and in towns of Eastern Galicia, because the example, the uh, the number of examples of real cooperation was, uh, in my opinion, was uh, not so, not so, not so, uh, not so, not so, not so big, not so great. But thank you very much for this question because, in fact, it it makes um, this uh, this this uh, um, historical phenomenon I was talking about much more complicated. And it definitely should be this Jewish aspect of this conflict should be definitely taken into account. So thank mm -hmm. you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for that uh, clarification and for that distinction. Um, interestingly, whatever the Ukrainian side reaches there on the discursive level, that's of course then being uh, overshadowed by the by the Petljura pogroms uh, in in later years. So um, it's but it's uh, of course uh, interesting to study that from the perspective of the years 1918 and 1919. And it's also interesting how the city or the interest in the city of, of uh, Lviv uh, generates and keeps on generating so many fine historians. I mean, the Lviv historians, it's a, it's a community of its own. It's a, a fascinating um, group of, of, of scholars, I would, <laughs> I would argue. Uh, with that, we have reached the end of our time, unfortunately. It's been a great and it's been a fascinating um, panel. I think uh, the, the exchanges and the uh, discussions will continue. I will have a follow-up question for you, Jagoda, on Werner Zombard. And um, it's been a starting point maybe for, for ongoing discussions. Um, Thomas, we will talk about civil wars. <laughs> and so I thank you for, for having joined us. It's been um, a fantastic discussion, even though very short. Um, and well, thanks for staying with us for the rest of the conference. We have now a short uh, break of, uh, where's the timetable? Um, chat room, someone? 30 Gabor? minutes, I think. 30 minutes, brilliant. We start at 12 o'clock. Okay.
Okay, and we will see each other at noon for our next panel. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. See you. See you.